Good to see you again, Will. Yes, ma'am. It is good to see you, too. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a pretty day in Tennessee. What about Texas? Uh, 80 degrees outside. That's what I thought. And, which go. is unre- unseasonably warm. We got fire danger weather coming again this afternoon, which is you know, whatever. Um, yeah, it, but it is beautiful <laughs> before the wind starts blowing. While people are jumping in, I got a question about like methodology. So like you've got like a, a big project. Does that project use one methodology and kind of fit everything within it? Or does it choose methodologies based on like the part of the landscape or? It's kind of something that you could play around with depending on um, how you differentiate between the methodology and the credit class. So if you're talking about project eligibility, the way that Region Network is, is working on this is keeping project eligibility out of the methodology itself, keeping that in the credit class so that that methodology could be used more broadly. So if it's a soil organic carbon one, that soil organic carbon methodology could be used in grazing across the board. So the idea is to have some flexibility there. I think that we'll see a spectrum. We'll have like really specific methodologies that can really only be applicable to a certain area. Like like but, Western then, riparian or whatever. I mean, it's, sure. yeah, cool. Yeah, I see there being a, a spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, totally. So I, in the chat, I posted a um, Notion link, which obviously this was kind of, this was going to be just a work session with like Jeff and, a few of us from Basin, so we didn't do much prep, but then we, you know, a bunch of conversations led to uh, opening it up. Um, so, th- so the notion is a little, um, you know, it's not fully complete. Um, th- a lot of this is a result of several months worth of work, but it's just all in other places where I haven't consolidated it yet, or we have not consolidated it yet. So the notion will be kind of the main working, like, list to go from we're going to kind of do um some group you know breakouts we'll do some group discussion and then it, this is a drop-in style last minute so people are going to come and go so if you know obviously if you have you know stuff whatever just we don't expect you to be here and and i think other people are going to be just joining randomly um as you know as we we go along uh, i did set up a, a mural also mural board uh similar to rebecca what you you all did um, not as fancy. It's just it's just a blank mural board, but we can basically uh, start adding stuff. Uh, breakout groups can maybe make a frame for each breakout group and kind of add their own stuff there. And then we'll come back to the main group and um, summarize what they talked about. But um, so let, let's get, just give one more minute for people to join. I got to grab a glass of water. So uh, like Curve has CeeLo and they have some other projects. And, and one of the one of their like smaller projects is called Collectiva, mm-hmm. I think. And they just had some like meetings, talk about strategy or whatever. And, and they, it's all on the island of Curacao. And so I was just, I don't know. I think that I wish we could all go hang out somewhere like that. Probably do that. I think that's a, a practical plan. The region grant, is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Why don't we start with, um, Rebecca, you're here from region. You know, Basin is creating a methodology to submit to region registry. And so I think a good place to start would be Vera, ACR, Gold Standard, new ones popping up, OFP, Cello. Uh, and then you give an overview of, of where region registry, where region ledger fits in, kind of that ecosystem and, and kind of why, why Basin is here creating a methodology you know, and, and how that works and how other people can do that as well. Yeah, totally. I think that's a great place to start. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Becca from Region. Um, I wear a couple hats. One is running the grants program. One is working more broadly with partners. And the other is that I'm a soil scientist. Um, so good old spectrum there, but I'm within the registry and science team. And um, we have been over the past um, six months in particular, really trying to um, grapple with how we sit in the space uh, alongside all these other registries. And so when we think about what a registry is, as a a place that tracks offset projects and issues credits off of those, um, you know, verifies and certifies. That is kind of the the classic idea of what a registry is. And the way that we see those registries currently functioning, um, we we see a lot of of gaps and needs and inefficiencies um, and inequities. And so our, our vision with the region registry is to really flip the the script on that top-down approach and to say that the creation, development, and verification of ecological assets, so not just carbon, but others as well, should be geared towards the stakeholders themselves 
um, towards the farmers and the methodology developers and the folks that um, are critical to that equation and that should be benefiting from these exchanges. And so the the registry itself is kind of playing playing ball with the classic registries and saying that like we we see that there is a tracking and verification process that needs to be created. But how can we create that? using web3 tools and open source approaches how can we utilize a decentralized approach to methodology development to verification um, to credit class creation and administration that will really enable us to have a fully decentralized registry program to where the people that are making decisions about credit classes and methodologies and what credits are on chain are the people that should be making those decisions instead of having a, a really more hierarchical approach um, that we currently have, where the methodology developers and the land stewards are not the ones in that room making the decision. We're on that path. We are really in the early stages of, of that path, um, but that is the vision. And we see that as being um, obviously really tightly linked to the ledger and to all that blockchain can do to for transparency and immutability and um, accountability and creativity. And the as the registry moves in that direction of decentralization, there's going to be a lot of work to do um, on a lot of levels with engaging land stewards and um, processes for methodology development and peer review, and a lot that, um, that I already see being touched on today in this work session. So what we've learned kind of over the, the past few years as we've been building pathways for methodology and project developers and developing out our own grasslands, uh, carbon plus grasslands method is really seeing firsthand um, the huge need and the huge potential and all of the blocks in between and that those blocks are not going to go away unless we literally create around them and ask more questions and bring more people into the equation. Um, and so carbon plus grasslands, for instance, um, we need to be able to predict sequestration better. We need to be able to associate sequestration with practices. And so that's a big scientific effort. And we're trying to could coalesce and move on that. Um, so that's just one example of many of the blocks where instead of us saying, we see the we see the problem and we're going to fix it. We see that as a really collective effort um, that we can all stand to benefit. the The practical like methodology level of um, of the registry is to ultimately have a library of methodologies that someone could go to and select ones in kind of a modular approach, select ones that make sense to them, take one riff off of it, make it their own, it's something that's more creative and human and allows for us to innovate at the level of need. And as we all know, because we're all here, the need is is uh, an urgent. So that's the, the methodology vision at that point. And even within that, being able to have different tiers of rigor. So you having institutional methodologies uh, that produce institutional credits. And then on the other end of the spectrum, having community methods and community credits to where you have really alternative verification approaches using NFTs like camera trap footage of Jaguar habitat and stuff that 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 really enables folks to create and innovate. And therefore the, the credit class creation can reflect that that ingenuity of methodology. So that's like that's the big picture. That's what we've learned where we are now is trying to focus on the design of the registry program itself, um, asking hard questions about peer review, trying to figure out um, different methodology approaches from practice based all the way to carbon focus um, institutional credits, thinking about credit class administration. Those are a lot of things that are on our table right now. And even though it feels like we're in the weeds on a lot of it, we're also really trying to listen um, and hear from everybody who's actually trying to do the work. So how's that for overview, Timo? That, that's great. I mean, I you know what a lot of things obviously stuck out to me, but like modularity, is something we're, we're focused a lot on in a, in a web three environment in like this plug and play this interoperable world um blockchain world with composability in you know in the refi movement creating value exchanges and incentives to create the outcomes so that, that really sticks out to me and then and then the only way to me to do that is like through open source or building in public or so that you can see what other projects are working on uh for example i was listening to curve labs yesterday 
and they were talking about like i think the traditional startup mode is like you have to build everything you start from scratch you build everything it's a competitive environment you build in a silo and you have to do everything and you keep it private whereas this it's like why reinvent the wheel you know like with, with DAOs, for example we're calling them DAOs. people think they're new but they're really just co-ops they're just a they're just a different way of an association or a partnership or a business organization. So we don't have to reinvent everything. And if we share more and we use interoperable money wagos and composability procedures, we can move faster, better together, bigger um, at the scale and speed we need for the climate crisis. So I think one, one thing, Becca, would be what's the process if someone else wanted to create a methodology to submit to region registry? Kind of what does that look like? How hard is it? And how does it compare to other? Yeah, totally. Um, how it compares to other registries is that um, I think we're we're hell bent on making sure you can create a methodology, whereas I feel like other registries are hell bent on you not um, or making it expensive. So um, just to be frank, um, but the, the process really begins in the concept note phase. And for most folks, it's like, I have this idea, like, I know that this is, this is the thing to do. And once you submit a concept note, just on our website, create your own methodology, submit a concept note. From that, some really cool steps can happen. For instance, you're interested in creating a water quality credit or something. And we know that we have 15 others out in the world that are building something similar. So one of those first steps is to say like, this is awesome. Let's get you in a space with these folks to talk about how you could work together. Again, not remaking the same wheel. If it's something newer, then our job is to be able to walk you through that path of what does it take to move from concept note to full methodology? Like what kind of methodology are you wanting to create? What level of rigor are you going for? Um, what are the MRV costs? How can you bypass MRV costs? Like to really have that that creative support. So that's the path where we're doing more of that that one-on-one -on -one shepherding. So it can kind of go in those two directions depending on need. Oftentimes it falls into that community category first. One that's moving right now is mine reclamation. I've got like five people that are exploring mine reclamation. And like even though it's like in awesome mine, mine. like I'm strip sure. mining and yeah. yeah, and all over the world. So obviously these people need to be in the same room to talk about how a base method could be built that then they color with their own, you know, particular ecosystem needs. So I think that's the creative process. Like that's the, the pathway overall. Um, one piece of that pathway is that once, once a methodology kind of idea is fleshed out to a certain extent, then that lives on what is forthcoming, which is an external roadmap. Um, it's gonna be a notion, region, methodology, external roadmap to where folks can go on and they can see methodologies that are moving at different levels of progress, see how they could dock in and be able to connect from there. Putting it out in public, having needs on each of those cards so that you can see like, oh, this methodology needs this thing. I do that, like, here's where I can play. Um, so definitely the the plug and play approach. Cool, um, I, I think two more things. I, I know this was short notice for you, Becca, so you probably have Ooh, other stuff cool. to do. Um, but two things, like one, I'd like to open up questions for region network or for becca so use the hand raise function here in a second if you have um, questions or drop them in the and then before we do why, why people are raising their hands the region ledger and like the modules right like eco credits you know we're talking parcel you know talking property they're kind of further down the line um where where do you see that just so everyone knows kind of i mean a lot of people here know that stuff but like just just because we're recording this like you create a methodology then what right you have you have the land you have the project and then what are the tools to actually mint the credits create the credits mrv data and then sell the credits which is you know the emerge the decks you're working on as well i think would be useful to kind of like what's the toolbox right um and that's where we start talking about credit class creation and administration and this is where this is a lot of active work that's going on with our um, ledger and interfaces team right now. And the the vision here is for the, the methodology is good. It's gone through whatever level of review and the credit class has been kind of stipulated. You have a dashboard and you're able to see the the credit batches that are coming and you're you're able to administer 
based on if those um, meet that credit class criteria. So the idea is, is for not for us to not be the credit class administrators. We don't want to be the gatekeepers. It's the people that actually own the the methods and are using them that should be those gatekeepers. And then the the vision functionality is for then for credits to be able to be minted from that from that interface. Um, right now, it's a command line interface. So the the goal is to really have that be an easily use clean workspace for credit class administrators to go into where you don't need to know code. So that's underway. Super excited about it. Um, I think it's going to mean open the floodgates moment for folks to move into these roles that um, that they're totally capable of doing and they just need the right platform to do it in. Um, so it's really the the methodology moving into credit class, moving into credit class administration, and then um, minting the, the eco credit. Awesome. Uh, Will and Kyle, they, they had a couple questions. Do you see them in the chat, Becca, if you want to? Yeah, totally. Kyle, um, great question about stats about your land and finding out how many carbon tons are sequestered. Uh, we'd love to see thoughts on that. Could be considered a methodology. I think this is bigger than a methodology. This is the need. The need is for land stewards and project developers and methodology developers to click on a map and to know if this is worthy of exploring for carbon or not. It's just a knowledge point. So if somebody knows, then they know if they should pursue a carbon project. If not, then they need other options like a practice-based credit or ecosystem credits that aren't carbon centric. This gets into like additionality and stuff where we've got folks that have been practicing regen for ages that don't meet additionality requirements, but should still be rewarded. So you're getting like, that's a big block. It's one that I see um, being explored with a, a tool called the look -see tool by CSIRO, which is the research arm of the Australian government. I'll put it into the chat. And it's a really um, kind of one of the many plays on um, exploring this. And it seems to me to be um, one of the best that we have now, but it's just, just for Australia. So Regen Lands is a project that we're working on that Giselle Booman, our um, our lead scientist is doing expressly for this, um, that you would be able to click on a location, see an estimated sequestration rate that's associated with a practice. So it's actually legitimate. It's not just this random range to make you feel good. Um, and that that would really be a, a an interface layer for like all potential carbon um, projects. So great question. Yeah, Will, surface mining, you have a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you connect with others? Um, totally. You have my email or Discord or whatever. I'm happy to, to um, do that. I'm actually working on a local methodology for strip mining in the Southern Appalachian. So I'm particularly jazzed about um, this one and like habitat restoration. Are there any other, other hands raised? I think those are the chat I, questions. I think that's it for now. Um, cool. Becca, thank, thanks so much for the, for the rundown. Uh, looks, or I guess Christian has a question. Go ahead. Christian. I just um, I mean I just want to ask because in terms of like, is there any thoughts in terms of like the actual literal data that's being collected by these various methodologies and allowing them to be interoperable? Yeah. It's like in terms of like and so I got so there's a proof of like uh, yes, like these follow the methodologies, but allowing all these things to kind of add up to kind of for machine learning to eventually be used on them and to allow for that lower the cost for those automated MRV. I kind of, I was wondering what, how the regen was like thinking about this. That's a really great question. Um, it's one that we're exploring on a couple of different levels. One is how to protect farmer data, how to create farmer data co-ops to where their individual data means more when it's collected together. How is that stored and utilized as metadata within credit classes? And how does that look different from one methodology to another? Um, and I think this is where there's the market that's, that has certain demands of what kind of data there is. And then there's the other spectrum, which is how, like you're saying, like how to make this more cost effective to where we don't need to have as much in-situ data collected. What I see is there being a lot of playing around with this within each methodology that's being created, that's striking that balance between the needs on the ground with what's possible in the market. Um, I, I would love to see um, things really reflect um, data that's even already been collected too um, in the past by different like conservation organizations um, to where in potential situations, maybe you don't even need in situ data. Like um, I think that it could be really cool to um, play around with what's possible. Well, yeah, that's something just more back on. That's something that kind of our company Athena Equity is focused on, really focusing on that data layer so that you can kind of 
where you can really index the methodologies, all the little details attached to sensors and how they seen that so that you can kind of filter for uh, the level of detail for methodology. And so all this data that's being wasted, even though it's not meeting the specific levels of institutional, it's not being wasted. Like people can still use that, use that data to kind of create assets, business intelligence, and really kind of allow, and how I'm using that to really help out on the incentives for data collection. Totally. So Christian, I'm putting my uh, email in the chat. I think that you would be really valuable to join kind of the data storage and architecture working group related to the practice-based method that we're calling the stewardship approach. If you're interested, shoot me an email and I'd love to connect you. Yeah, definitely will. Sorry about that. Yeah, and I think, Christian, what, what will happen here in some of the breakout rooms, like uh, Neil is on the call, who's a data scientist. Chase is on the call, who's working on satellite and other data, um, ecosystem data. So there's there's going to be, I think, some cool connections here just with the people. I mean, you already know uh, TR, I think, who's on here. Um, but the, Becca, thanks so much for the, the overview. Appreciate it. Uh, if you have to go, no problem. If you want to stay, uh, you're welcome to, of course. Well, but I just want to say thanks and you, y'all be in touch. Um, this was great. I'm going to dump, but good luck. See ya. Okay. Thanks Becca. Appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, for those of you who just joined, uh, we do have a notion page in the chat up at the very top of the chat that we're kind of working off loosely. Um, and then we're, we have a mural board, which we haven't jumped into yet, but we can add some stuff there. Um, basically, Basin, just to give you an overview of what, why we're here, what we're working on, um, Basin is structured structure as a DAO, but, but legally as a cooperative and kind of being come known as the project developer DAO. We, we're aiming to develop our own projects ourselves and creating a network of, of joint venture partners of project developers to share best practices, share resources, share knowledge, share people, and, and do climate um, conservation and restoration at scale. Uh, my background is in commercial and investment real estate, 20 years of property investment. Um, I've done deals in 40 states, a billion and a half dollars of volume. And I started to get concerned about the climate crisis a few years ago with the wildfires uh, near my house here in Colorado. So many of you have heard this story before, but I just want to give you some context of why Basin is working at the real property level. And we sort of like financial feasibility and how to get projects done, how to, how to make projects, not just pencil out, but how to actually make them profitable so people can live their lives, pay for their families, do the things they want to do while making an impact and doing something good for for climate, carbon, nature. So, um, you know, our wins, right, is through real property. So, if you look at property and you say, okay, what's the boundaries of the property, the polygon, basically, that's you know what's within that boundary. It's you know, it could be mountains, it could be desert, it could be a vacant building, it could be a residential subdivision, it could be a vacant uh, shopping center. I mean, it, you know, basically my lens right personally is like everything is real estate whether you're humans or biodiversity or water or or air to a certain extent somehow it ties back to real property and whether or not you like the real property law or the real property system that's the world we live in and there's legal rights and jurisdictional rights uh benefits but also ordinances um, things you have to comply compliance issues but but it gives you a sandbox to play in so our thesis is if we can play within the, the real property rights and the, the systems we have in place, we can actually create the change we want while adding some other tools to our toolbox, such as credit creation, um, natural capital, eco credit creation, social impact credit creation, and then all just the basic stuff of like, how do you lease a property better? How do you produce more hay from a property? How do you maybe subdivide a property, you know, how, how do you renovate a building? How do you create a more holistic development? So, you know, the way I kind of look at it is like, we're project developers for climate, carbon and nature, but really what we are is, is real estate developers, but just for a different purpose for kind of that holistic, bigger vision impact, like positive outcome. So how do we combine anything at our disposal to create, you know, the world we want to live in and the communities we want to, you know, drive by and walk our kids and dogs in? Um, but, but basically, you know, we, some of this work for the basin methodology came out of a climate sprint that we did last summer. The climate sprint was focused on how do we best value ecosystem services and co-benefits in the context of carbon development. And a lot of that discussion revolved around externalities and these things that people don't want to take into consideration, basically things that are out there, they, they are internal to someone, someone has to pay those costs, but the, the externalities shouldn't really be there. Like, like that's just kicking the can down the road saying, 
hey, it's not our problem. So how do we eliminate externalities and then also monetize and create financial incentives around what, what were called co-benefits, if carbon was the core benefit, social impact, biodiversity, water quality, all this stuff, a, an additional benefit. But the resulting work from that was what's called the core benefits label. And we can, you know, I think a lot of you have seen that, but that was like a holistic approach to assess a climate project and, and make it financially feasible, make it so you could actually get it done. And some of the people here, Neil, um, Tommy, there are some of the people that are you know in that climate sprint a uh, super smart team that are continuing with the core benefits work. And they've set up a consulting company called Vallast around that. So that's a, a separate conversation, but if people want to explore the core benefits label and how to apply it to a project, maybe how to get your project certified, how to kind of do that assessment uh, back of the napkin, like quicker, like reach out to Neil, who's here on the call. I'm just kind of going down the list here. The the basin methodology takes a lens of looking at a property and it can be any type of property. And how do you start with what we're calling the full stack, which is every single thing you could possibly consider. And it might sound like overwhelming, but it's like, what can you consider? Like, what are you missing about that property? And the way we started to look at it is like on the ground or, or above ground, what's under the ground, and then what flows across the ground, basically, or the land. And so taking that kind of standpoint of like, we're like the new survey party or the new landmen or the new, like we're, we're looking at this landscape and we're saying, okay, like we're not extracting stuff from it. We're not extracting minerals and coal and, and oil and like forest products. We're actually trying to create value from the positive things such as clean air, clean water, uh, healthy health and human benefits. And um, so we'll hold on one second. Let me just wrap up here. Um, and then the idea with, with the working session is to look at this full stack, see what we're missing today, see what we could add, see what we could delete, and then start to figure out how we could apply it to project level. Like the full stack is probably never ever gonna apply to one project because it's too many things for one project. It doesn't fit in this ecosystem. It doesn't fit in that climate, that latitude, what, you know, that municipality. But it's like, how can you quickly assess the full stack, apply the stack that applies, maybe save some stuff for later? Uh, uh, Christoph was, we were talking about it and he was saying like punt some of the stuff, which actually preserves additionality for later. You, you establish a baseline today in the project, but you save some stuff for later if you don't have the, the time, the resources, or maybe the market opportunity just isn't there. But it's like establishing the baseline of what's on the property and then what could happen with the property and then how do you track in MRV all this stuff to create the outcomes we want and actually create real on the ground positive change. So I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, Will, what's your, what, you had a comment and if anyone else wants to raise their hand. It just, it, so like a, a, a developer considering this whole full stack is going to have to interact not only with the surface owner, but like all the surface user, users and then also anybody that has rights to the minerals um, or to right of ways or uh, I mean to build infrastructure. There, there's it, it's not just the landowner and the land user that are parties here. Is all I want to say. Thanks, Timo. Yeah, no. And Will, just so everyone knows, Will's, Will's an attorney by training, right? And and um, that, that's that's a super important part of this is like the data and the due diligence. It's not just like scientific data, but it's actually real property data. It's, it's title work, it's lease agreements, it's uh, use agreements, it's stuff that's on record, stuff that's off record that basically you'd have to kind of the way we're seeing it, you'd have to set up a due diligence file, right? That has all these different things that affect the property. And you have to consider those that, that so on record, off record, but also like zoning restrictions, land use codes, uh, you know, laws, you know, I mean, all, I mean, all that stuff. And those like constraints like can be bad, right? But it's actually good because it's like gives you like, okay, we can and we can't do that at a property. But that, that's a very good point. But that's going to be like a, a crucial data set of like this, this methodology. Anyone else have any questions before we like for, for Basin and for like the bunch of the people that participated in the climate sprint uh, this summer, I think region network, I, you know, I think a lot of other people are seeing like, like carbon, 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 right? Like that's the thing, like, okay, like that's the most exciting thing. That's the most monetizable thing. That's the speculative thing. But, but my personal view, and I think a, a lot of people here share this view or you wouldn't be here is that it's all interconnected that, you know, climate, carbon, nature, Human health and well-being is all interconnected. It doesn't live in a silo. It doesn't live by itself. The economy doesn't live by itself. 
it's so it's, it's this holistic approach. What, what our goal is here to create a high quality carbon asset and or eco credit or natural capital assets that eventually will probably be priced per ton in carbon. It's like a premium or a bespoke, like high quality product. And in, in like, you know, for example, Stripe with their permanence, like they're probably not going to invest in this, you know, Microsoft, you know, if, or another big corporation who only has a budget of 10 to $20 a ton probably wouldn't buy these things. But like I, I got off a call with what's called Ceres, uh, C-E-R-E-S the other day, and they're, they're a financial advisor, a nonprofit uh, financial sector advisor. Uh, to Black, BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, all the big banks. And their meeting literally was like, what are the benefits to people? What are the benefits to environment? What are the social impact outcomes in addition to carbon? So they're sitting here advising the biggest investors and BlackRock was on the call saying, yeah, we need to figure out how our portfolio companies don't just remove carbon, but actually provide these other societal benefits. So one of the outcomes from this methodology is to create this holistic outcome and wh whether it be priced in carbon or sold as individual eco credits, biodiversity credits, clean water credits, social impact credits, recreation credits, education credits, that's the flexibility. Um, but, but some of this work, it, and I can share the link later, if you, if you go back to, you know, everyone's heard of IPCC, but last summer there was a joint workshop with uh, IPBES, the Interpanel um, Body for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and that was with IPCC. And their, their report basically concluded what we're talking about here. And this, this was some of the inspiration for the, the methodology of like, we need a holistic system and they call it the climate biodiversity social system nexus. It's a mouthful, but like climate, you know, resilience, adaptation, mitigation, biodiversity, ecosystems, nature, et cetera, social people, right? And then the system that interlinks it and then the nexus of where it all comes together. And they also harped on this term called adaptive capacity, which is like in the face of climate change, like how can projects, how can rules, how can policies, how can methodologies adapt to the changing needs on a year to year you know, decade to decade basis. It's not just like plant trees, it's gonna sequester carbon for 70 years. We're gonna do a 10 year buffer. We're gonna sell the 60 years of carbon today and then put it to bed. Like, right, the world, world to me doesn't work that way. So uh, this IPBS, IPCC report is like a huge like guiding light. And I suggest everyone read that uh, just, you know, to, to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So I'll, I'll stop there for a minute before we uh, go, got one more thing and then we'll break into some, some groups. Yeah, Timo, I had one about the Moss Amazon NFT work. Um, how does that work from a real estate perspective? If you've looked at that project at all, because it says that you actually own the land tied to the NFT. So Kyle, that, I mean, I, you know, I've been going back and forth with Louise or whoever, you know, the, the, the leader, the you know, CEO of Moss. Um, and I'm, I haven't like looked through his answers, but we had a, you know, a, I think a constructive dialogue about that. Um, to me, you know, coming from the real estate industry, that's very complex, how you fractionalize ownership of a property. There are so many laws from securities laws, land use laws, to local jurisdictional laws, to subdivision laws of how, you know, titles, deeds, like it's very, very complex. And like, I don't know exactly how they're doing it. You know, I think they've cut it up into one hectare, hectare uh, sections, but they, they're they saying you have legal access with your NFT to a property that like doesn't have roads or, or access. So I don't know, you know how you get to that property and, and access it, but I think we're going to see a lot of projects like that. And to me, it's more about the flow, like the legal chain of title, and who controls the rights or and who provides the rights. I, there's interesting projects in, in what's called the RWA, real world asset space, you know, in, you know, that, that are happening on, on blockchain and rental properties and fractionalization, but it's very, very messy from a security standpoint. And frankly, I think, you know, we or us or them could get in a lot of trouble cross jurisdictional trying to fractionalize property at the title level. And it, it, and I think it could be very, very messy in the future um, from, you know, if you have a hundred NFT owners of a property, how do you ever make a decision regarding that property and do something with that property later? You can't find, you know, 20 of the owners. So it's for, for me it, or, or for us in Basin, we're looking at it from a level of like, okay, what's the chain of title and how is it governed? And how does it flow back to, you know, who does it flow to and, and how is it governed? And we're looking at it from like a, a, a you know, global starts local where global like framework, but local on the ground, like stakeholder governance, stakeholder input, stakeholder beneficiaries on the ground in the community using the global resources of the, of the network. So it's, it's, to me, it's not like fractionalizing, Hey, I own this 
you know, quarter acre, or I own this, you know, hundred, hundred foot by hundred foot parcel. It's more like what's your share in the network and how does that legal chain of title flow back relative to the governance in the, in the token. Hmm. Thanks for shedding some light on that. Yeah. And there's a lot of, yeah, we, that's, an, we can have another conversation about that. Um, we have, I have, um, have a separate working group potentially with Cello and Coinbase and some other people, uh, MakerDAO working on real world assets. So that's, that's a separate conversation, but, uh, but, uh, you know, if you want to talk about that, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. It's something we're still trying to figure out from a conservation side, like how we fractionalize these pieces of land and, and sell them and not allow access or do allow access. Um, so yeah, I'd love to chat more about that. Cool. Um, so the, the last thing is like this web three, like it's cliche, right? Like web three refi, like it's all, you know, all the new words, but there's some, there. To me, there, there's something there that's important with modularity, composability, and interoperable. So like from the context of this stack that we're getting ready to look at, and we're gonna do, we'll do breakout rooms, but like the modularity is the idea with the basin methodology is that holistic and it's broad enough to, to be supported by real on the ground MRV documented practices and data. But at the same time, it could be modular enough where a certain line item in the stack could be swapped out with another methodology that like Becca was talking about. For example, if you're doing a project, but you like really need to sell reforestation credits or avoid avoided deforestation credits, or you're a, it's an ag project and you really need to focus on soil carbon, but you can swap out a wine item in the stack and use another methodology. And basically it ups the game. Like, I think the goal of what, what Basin is trying to create is like, I mean, it's not good enough, but like, it, I mean, better than good enough, but like it can test the sniff test or pass the sniff test it can with you know withhold the scrutiny whatnot of like what are what's the mrv of the stack what's the baseline and how is it defensible basically and how is it high quality proving that high quality but at the same time like modularity if someone wants to adopt this methodology and then plug and play other methodologies like for example ixo is working on social impact stuff in like bonds so if someone wants to plug in like a social impact module rather than the basin module like they can do that. And the, the other idea is that, you know, we're building this for the regen registry, but, but this is open source and someone could take it to sell up. Someone could take it to the open forest protocol, like, you know, just full transparency. Like the idea is that we're creating a, a base layer that then other people can use. And, and we're doing it at the, the project level, um, a holistic level than rather than just like, like for example, afforestation, like the, one of the examples we've always used, it's like in the savannas, they're, in, down in South America, they're basically coming into native grasslands, native habitat, and they're taking away that to put in eucalyptus and spruce to sequester as much carbon as possible. Like that's, to me, that's like the definition of insanity of like, I mean, that's just mono crop or monoculture all over again in the name of carbon. So like, how do we create a system where people can actually start to evaluate and benefit and, and make projects financially feasible using all these. I, I know that was a lot, but that's uh, that's the background. And so does anyone have any questions before we, we do some breakouts? Cool. So I think we, ha we have uh, 19 people, which I'm totally psyched, um, which is awesome, or I guess 18 people. And um, we have the, the mural board, which so if each person, each group, we'll just do three different groups. If each group can um, create a section for their kind of what they're working on uh, and just make notes, it doesn't have to be in any format, uh, but just in the mural kind of make a, you know, a section and put all your stuff there, label it group one, group two, group three. And then at the end of the, each group, if someone, if someone from each group could just give a quick summary of what you talked about and what, what you think. Um, but the first group breakout, so, so if you go to the notion document, there's a, the full stack, which is what we've come up with over two months worth of work or, or, or or longer uh, worth of work, and they're not. It's not in any order. But the first breakout session is is basically to evaluate the the full stack and look at what's missing, what could be added, what could be deleted. You know, maybe why it's confusing, maybe why it's not. Like just a general discussion about the the full stack. And I'm gonna I'll drop that here, and then we'll just do. We're gonna do like a 10 minute session. Everyone good with that? You break out room. Bear with me. I'm just setting the shuffle. You're doing good, Timo. But Sam at Regen is an impressive dude for running meetings. To totally. I, yeah. I'm. You, you can tell I'm kind of copying the. I, I forked the stewardship meeting. I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> okay. See you guys in a second. Then Madhuban and uh, Tr. I'm not sure if you guys can join a a group. I think this is still the main group here. I'm going to go to breakout group. We had a pretty interesting.
Um, and I like what you're saying, Christian, about the data opening up value to the landowner. Like whoever gets in it is going to start seeing the benefits. But how do you show them? Like how do you persuade them to start? Exactly. It's like a little tricky if they can start off. But with Web3, because everyone's using the same kind of data, like uh, database, as opposed to a million apps having their own kind of style of databases, it's kind of like a domino effect where once we get more onboard data in, we can all kind of start using it to benefit, start getting more and more insights. And so now pretty soon, small organizations can kind of, since they're using decentralized storage in Web3, they can have data sets that can rival a Google or an Amazon size and they can open up to a, that AI. And so it's not just locked in. You can, AI scientists aren't just working on what Google and Amazon wasn't working on. They can actually follow their passion now that they have this global repository of climate data. Yeah, cool. ethnobotany actually could be added to this whole list of full stack. A uh, little late thought. <laughs> Let me, I'm just going to add it uh, here on the on the mural. Ethnobotany. Uh -huh. Yeah. If, if, if you look at the mural, um, Jeff and I created a little one there for group three. And you, you guys are welcome just to add to that uh, or create your own. But if, like, what was the consensus? If someone wants to just go from uh, group one or group two, just raise your hand and what's missing from the stack? How can we simplify the stack? Is it too much? Kind of, what, what are was, your thoughts? I was in group one. It, it was really good. We spent most of the time introducing ourselves and getting to know each other. Um, and I think really like the whole thing is like what stack i mean we've got this list and but it's all like we all kind of feel like we're working on something hypothetical here and, and how do we bridge it to real life um and there is an acknowledgement that it's hard to like like lease or acquire property by promising future crypto um we, we've got that uh it's, it's just not as persuasive as a check in hand yeah and i really like the cultural resources were included in this full stack because in texas that's private property right and it they get bulldozed right now but if, if if that actually benefited the landowner they would be preserved and recorded and reported cool i'm uh joining late here how can i hop on this uh, mirror board. Um, the link is at the very top of the chat, or maybe the chat got. Uh, let me. Uh... Yeah, when I joined in late here, I, I don't see any new mess or old messages. All right, okay. cool. Thank you. Um, I think the stack might be missing, kind of uh, talking about the data itself that we're collecting and the scenes around that. And so, for particular land ownership, and like, and if they can kind of have all this data and they collect it, they create offsets. That's really great for that particular land. But if we want to use that to kind of. Uh, help understand the crisis as a whole and what's going on. We really want to ha be, uh, make sure that the data that this land is kind of creating and using to verify their carbon offsets is interoperable with similar land like in the area or doing it. If we can have everything, like we gotta make, it's really important like when the industry is early now, make sure everyone is using kind of common standards on the data to really allow that interoperability. And that that's will unlock the AI like much more kind of long-term value and possibility. So I, I love that, Christian, um, interoperable da data. And then, you know, yeah, maybe data should be a line item in the stack. Like uh, breakout two is going to be, um, we're going to talk about data and MRV. So that will be a great spot to, and, and yeah, maybe it needs to go in the full stack. Like, I guess the way I was looking at it is like the full stack is like the things we're going to look at. And then you got to, then we have to figure out, okay, what's the data? What's the measurement, you know, quantity, qualitative around each item in the stack cool. it, make, it makes sense like kind of for kind of figuring out i was thinking in terms of like just as like an, an organizational level like for those kind of ones we figure out for the methodologies and like the data on the science aspect for making sure kind of from an organizational perspective like tying it to like the data science perspective for like interoperable data sets allowing kind of the like we talked about with rebecca allowing kind of different levels of uh data to show again like, yeah, this is institutional grade data methodologies this is like slightly below and the and that and that could really unlock the profitability aspect and the, and the key of like how can we make this incentivize over time because those landowners suddenly they can use that same data they were using to verify their carbon credits for business intelligence for you know an agricult a major agricultural company or governments looking to understand weather patterns or insurance providers. And so really the key is allowing that data to be reused over and over again to keep drawing profit back to the original landowner. Okay, cool. Um, Something else to add to the full stack would be evaporative loss. And I saw one of y'all's comments like solar over canals. And the reason I like that, for one, is it, it stops the evaporative loss. And so can we use region to incentivize a transition from water stored on the surface that evaporates away to water that's stored on the ground or 
with solar panels over it or whatever, can, can we account for that evaporative loss and claim benefit from it? Cool. Love that. I mean, Will, like something we've talked a lot about in all these different groups is like this awareness of like, how do you make people just aware that like, that's something you should look at, pay attention to, maybe explore. Yep. And Jeff says, and beavers. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, like what are the different things to look at? So the, this, the full stack is really like a, a, a rigorous, it's supposed to be a rigorous scientific tool to assess what's available. So like, what should I apply to this property? How could I apply it to the property? It's not a quick back of the napkin assessment. It's like, maybe it takes a, you know, a couple hours or a half day or a couple of weeks to, to do to like figure out, okay, what, what actually makes sense. It's not just like, okay, we're going to sit down and rate this project. Um, so something in the, in the intro, which I was going to mention is just as a side note for people to look at, like commercial real estate appraisal, number one. And number two, there's a, a, a discipline in commercial real estate called cost segregation, where I, I was trying to say, okay, what exists in the real world similar to what we're trying to create here in terms of like assessment and bodies reviewing and third party review. Appraisals, commercial appraisals are a hundred page document and take, take two or three weeks to do by one person or maybe two people. Cost segregation can come in and be done in a week and they literally count every single door, every single doorknob, the, they calculate the concrete, they calculate the signage, they calculate the furniture and they apply a dollar value to that. Both of those documents, a commercial real estate appraisal and a cost segregation report, either are used by banks, which are regulated financial institutions, and or used by the IRS for tax purposes. So I'm thinking about this methodology from that standpoint of like, how can like Vallis, the group I mentioned earlier, like, or how could another group, Athena or whoever, create services around this methodology where they come in and they provide this assessment in a report fashion and then the project developer can use it. I think this unlocks other like business opportunities. And then it, if we can create a standardized report for the methodology, kind of like, well, the IRS uses like an appraisal for an estate purpose, right? The IRS uses a cost segregation report. It's kind of like, why why can't this report be the same? Right, if we're, take, if we're collecting the data anyway and doing all this effort, like it's really just putting it into a, new, a different format for different purposes, like for them. Like, make, it makes a lot of sense. I really like that. And, and Christian, I mean, I think it, like something yeah, for all of us to talk about or think about is like, right, like Ocean Protocol or uh, Athena, right? Or like you guys are, or um, like Gaia, Digital Gaia popping up or Declimate. Like what are these data repositories, right? Or, or the region data module is actually some like, I think going to be along these lines is, is my understanding of it. So it's like, okay, what... Where do we put all this data? How do we use it? And then how do we spit it out so that it's useful? Who, who is in group two? Someone wants to, to summarize that. Hey, Brett, go ahead. Howdy. Yeah, I'm in a coffee shop, so it's a little noisy. So pardon the background noise. Yeah, we just kind of introduced ourselves. Uh, two of us were new to the scene here. So howdy, everyone. And uh, yeah, uh, just kind of getting the lay of the land, going through that document. And uh, yeah, here in things out don't really have too much commentary on things more than just kind of taking in uh the initial information cool and, and what's your like assessment like if you know being new, like let's say not necessarily new to the space but new to this like kind of what we're doing here like overwhelming too complex like um i think like what i'm trying to grasp at this stage is like whether this is like the objective is profit motivated and uh, in the realm of land acquisition and ownership, or is it more of a service entity that is assisting for entities that have land and then providing some type of service to assist in this? That, that's where I'm trying to assess right now. I, I think like that's the beauty of like an open source methodology of like, how do you use it? Like what, what's your wins you're looking through? Like for Basin, we, we have two different use cases. One is Basin buying properties, owning properties, operating properties in a com community governed fashion in monetizing, making these projects financially feasible to create the income and the, the impact, or excuse me, the, yeah, the, the outcome and the impact we want through a community governed process on the land using this methodology. So the, the first one is is 100% owned, Basin does it. The second one is a JV model, where if your family owns a ranch or you know of, you know, a, you're a city and you have this you know park and you don't know what to do with it, or this, you know, you're a corporation and you have this abandoned factory, like, what can we do with it, right? We can't sell it for some, it's too contaminated or what, you know, whatever. It's like this JV model where you don't want to sell it all the way or you can't sell it, but then like we help you basically do this stuff on the property to help create these like multi-stakeholder 
outcomes. But I think the third thing is, and Basin isn't really playing in that realm. I think there's a whole like opportunity for service providers, like we just talked about, of like conducting this, using the methodology, right, as a service. Like, okay, we provide data around this methodology. We provide, we conduct the methodology for you as a third party service provider. Um, I think it's really just the wins, you know, that you cool. Jeff, do you want to do our group or do you, uh, do you want me to? Ah, uh, you can do it. So Jeff and I, we, we, Jeff is in, in basin here. So we, we've already done, we've been doing this a long time. Uh, but Jeff, there's actually a lot of good things. Uh, we, we discussed that we kind of, like, we, we have some blind spots. So in, in the mural group three sesh one, uh, Jeff had a really good point about like, where does it fit in the region? Like, if, if you're looking at a property and we go back to this like storytelling of like, we are land surveyors and we're trying to, you know, trying to do something on the land. We're trying to build whatever we're trying to build. Like where does this parcel or where does this property fit in the ecosystem, the watershed, the region, the community? We, we're trying to, we, we kind of use the word terrain or like surrounding parcels, relational. So like we were thinking like we'll add a category related to that, like where it fits in, in the, in the watershed. For example, our general thoughts on is it too long or too uh, short was that like if it's too short, it's not going to be taken like <laughs> the credibility is going to go down, right? Like it, you know, but it's like it needs to assess enough stuff to to like create some legitimacy around it. Um, so we didn't think it was long because it's not we're not trying to do every single one of these things. It's more like a, an assessment, like a more detailed assessment tool of what you could do, like the awareness tool uh, we're talking about. Uh, so we didn't think it was too long. Um, we, we didn't think it can be any simpler. I mean, I guess the biggest thing would be like hierarchy of like, how do we organize it? And we're going to talk about that in the next session, but like, how do you take this whole stack? How do you break it down into categories or hierarchy, uh, where people can actually see, well, hold on one second and then start to categorize it and then apply it to a, uh, and then, um, yeah, we, we also talked about like a, a resilient score, like wildfire flooding. We didn't, we realized we didn't have energy, like energy storage, solar, that kind of stuff on the, on the property uh, or on the list. So we'll, we'll add that stuff. That's, that's the summary of group three. And then Will, go ahead. Something else that we might want to add to that list would be like transportation. Um, and, and so, I mean, some of that is going to be like, like we got roads on our project site or whatever. And then some of it is roads, you know, rainwater from roads, you know, is going to affect our, our property site. And, and so how do we deal with transportation infrastructure? And, and drainage. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a really good point. Like, and that, that goes back to like this flow of like on and off a of property. Like whether it's air, whether it's water, whether it's species, whether it's habitat, what are those flows? Anyone else have any comments just on the first session? Go ahead, Brett. Um, yeah, there was, so I added one other thing of just like uh, indigenous inclusion it seems like something that is just like, I've gone to enough kind of conferences and gatherings where it's like, that feels like it, it emerges uh, through some of the collective voice of the, of the land. Um, and then uh, another name I, I kind of want to just bring to, Bring up if people, folks aren't familiar with, um, you all know of uh, Darren Doherty and and Regrarians, but uh, their platform is just phenomenal, and he is an excellent educator. Um, I've gone to a, cu a couple of his uh, trainings and keynotes, and hits on a lot of these things more in an agricultural lens, but um, and not so much like bio biodiversity and that kind of thing. But could be a, a value. Do you want to drop that in the chat, Brett? Please. Cool. And I, and so, so James and Sev, Sev, a few, few other people just joined We're it's a come and go thing, but we did, we just did a breakout group. Uh, it's in the notion document. Um, do you guys have the notion document? Uh, I can drop that back in the link too. We're kind of just working down this, this document. We're, we're now at the bottom, um, in the breakout sessions. So session two, this one, we're going to do longer. If everyone's okay with it, we'll do, um, maybe, maybe we'll just do 10 minutes because we've already covered a lot of it. Um, so this is session two and we'll do, we'll do 10 minutes, uh, break out, discuss those things. And then we'll do the same thing. Just a summary of like, I think the, the goal is, is like, how do we narrow it down? You know, how do we go deep enough, but not too onerous. And then also like, how do you start to think about like composability? Like if it's not deep enough, like how do you plug and play a methodology into one of those layers? Um, and then the baseline data that we collect in the MRV around that. So, so that it builds this composability, this flexibility in the future, like what's the baseline data that we need to collect? Like how does soil data affect, you know, like how can we use that for carbon data or biodiversity data? Like kind of what are the, like we're, we're kind of starting to get into like, what are the base data sets that we need to do all this stuff in the stack? You know, that will probably be, have to be another working session as to like, 
what those look like and like you know christian to kind of your point of like what is it you know what, what where's the pool of data like what's the the starting point of data and how do you access it yeah so baseline data mrv how do you measure how do you report it and, and how do you create trust and legitimacy around it as well cool so we'll do um maybe we'll just do two groups this time because we're jeff and i were alone by ourselves we felt we felt lonely there jeff are those plants hanging from your roof <laughs> in the background jeffrey stevens yeah uh, pretty cool of course the plant guy Hey, I, I'm sorry. I I just got called into another meeting, so I like literally jump in, jump out. But just wanted to say hi, guys. We'll, Good to we'll see, see so many people. Okay. You sound better. You're not coughing today. <laughs> not right now. And this this is the main room. So join. You should be able to join another room here. I have to boogie. Pleasure to meet y'all, and I've really enjoyed the entirety of the conversation I was a part of here. So <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, Brett. Thanks for coming. And let's, yeah. let's connect on the back end. For sure. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Cool. So, so somehow we ended up with most of you guys in group one and just a few of us in group two. Um, group one, go, go ahead with what you guys came up with. Uh, uh, we talked about a lot of things. Um, yeah, like the, the baseline data, the need for it to integrate. Uh, yeah, shoot. It's the, that was a harder conversation for me to summarize, I guess. But we kind of see two aspects, and that is we need a human network to go out there and take samples or verify or do whatever we need to do. And then we also, yeah, what was, I, I guess, the, yeah, the, then over time we developed this this internet of things remote sensing gis network that um really cheapens the cost and heightens the value right but it's going to take some time yeah and something as important as like allowing kind of the data standards from various devices to kind of have like a white label period where they can kind of be kind of swapped in and out we want to avoid really allowing forcing certain methodologies to be tied to certain manufacturers and certain sensors because that allows them to have really gatekeeper status and really increase costs we want on the manufacturing side, we want to make it so as much competition is there as possible. So and then really drive costs down. Can we create like a short list of guidelines or whatever? And, and so like if you're going to work in this space, we don't want you to do whatever you're trying to prevent, these anti-competitive practices. Because like I'll, 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 I would make a statement in support of this. What do I say? Um, and, and it is problems like helium. You, you know, they do think where you have to have like a manufacturer regulated device in order to make money and you can't buy those stinking devices. And so it's really slowed down the network. It, it's a problem. We need this open manufacturer ecosystem. James, go ahead. You have your hand up. Oh, I can't can't hear you. Kind of do the group. So I, I, I'm, I'm obviously learning a lot. But, but it seems like you have one issue, which is you'll have like your validators. And, and in my mind, on a Web3 version, those are like keepers, right? Like they're the people that are trying to bring projects and, and, and ideas and, and, you know, authenticity to certain projects on the ground. And it seems natural to me that you're going to need a Web3 way of arbitrating disputes that, that are going to happen inevitably between these people. Maybe maybe they want to get on board. It's so I just think that if you're going to try to go all Web3, you, you kind of need to start gearing everything towards there where, where you have almost like human arbitration panels, whether it's it's Claros or, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, I, I guess my DAO has some whisperings of, of arbitration, but more, more for a legal standpoint. But it just seems like you're going to kind of need that inevitable judge system in this. And you might as well make that Web3, you know, where it's all on chain. Mm. I, I love that. And James, just so everyone knows, you're... You're talking about Wex DAO for arbitra arbitration. There's a few, you know, like Aragon Court, Claros, you know, uh, Lex DAO. Like I said, it, it, it seems like it's still at the nascent beginnings of, of things. But but I just, you know, like the overall concept is, is if you're going to have validators, you need somebody to judge whether or not they're good or bad actors, right? Like like you need to have some system to slash people for being dicks. So. <laughs> and how do you spell Claros? K-L-E-R-O-S. I think it's an I-O after that dot I-O. Then yeah, Aragon I Court, I believe, I is their product. Yeah, I think this is important and i think like region instead of trying to build their own network of validators like, like just all the projects on on cosmos would be best if, if we could refer to this this decentralized arbitration or validator network kind of like we refer to an oracle mm -hmm. that's a very big task i mean it's a whole new token or project or whatever if, if you want to do it on the ibc which i think we should do because ibc is the best cool um i, I agree uh sev, sev go ahead and then uh Antonio next. So I just want to, the way this kind of makes sense to me and thinking about approaching big issue and problem of, of MRV and how and what data to collect is organizing it into sort of three buckets because the, the method, methodologies kind of have it restricted by these three things. So one is um, data that you can collect without 
any additional equipment or sensors. So basically a data that can be collected from anybody with that could be photos that could be I feel like actually like photo and video is probably the one of the most like uh, transparent forms of data um, that you can collect. Uh, you know, that could take a lot of forms, but data you can collect as an individual without extra equipment, then data you can collect with additional sensors and equipment, and you get more complex and can get more in depth in that methodology. And then data that you can collect from a third party qualified validator. Um, so just, I, I feel like this might be helpful in thinking about the different methodologies is thinking about what data entry looks like for that methodology and how can it be applied into, for, for what, uh, data you want to collect, can it be done? Which bucket does that fall into? Seb, where, where would you put like satellite um, and remote sensing? So so not, not not necessarily like the first one, or excuse me, the second one, I would say like that's IoT, like on the ground, like sensors. Where would you put remote? Would you put that in the I, third or? I, that, I would put that in the second, in my opinion. I would, I would say, yeah, um, because I think for the most part, it, there's basically anything that requires a an additional level of difficulty or bar, sort of barrier to entry to gain access to that device or 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 um, tool, right? And so, satellite imagery is a tool that you kind of need an extra level of effort um, to obtain information from. So, I kind of see that as like a sensor that or or additional equipment that's needed, as opposed to like just taking a photo with your phone or something. And, and then the, the the differentiator between the third would be like qualified or or certified, someone who's like been trained. Right. Yeah. That's kind of and and that's um, similar to how you were speaking about the way appraisers look at it look at homes and they have this you know giant report that comes out for a home to figure out the value of it that would be that third bucket where it's this really like sort of high quality report that is much more in depth and you can kind of think about it as levels of complexity or it, or depth of data as well and then you can kind of assign values the and and errors of margin that are higher the less you know um, accurate data that you have. So that first bucket has less, um, maybe less, uh, can, you know, value that and be more conservative with, you know, estimates as far as what you're cool. Yeah. Like, uh, like reliance or like, cool. That those are great. Zeb, appreciate that. A Antonio, you had your hand up. Yeah. Just wanted to um, touch on the dispute resolution tool. Uh, cause, uh, we, we have a DAO on uh, one hive and how the, um, the resolution works through Celeste as it goes to honey token holders who then will, um, basically, uh, be the arbitrage, like the person in the middle that decides. And if they can't come to a conclusion, it keeps on going up and up and up. So I'm bringing this up because you can bake this into the basin token, uh, design where token holders can also be doing the dispute resolution for for the data verification. That's, and I think Open Forest Protocol is, is going to have something like that, the way I understand it, where like you can challenge or somehow I don't know if it's like a court or arbitration. I I like that. I mean, I, what do you think, Antonio, of like that being like a, a region module? Like for example, like you know, like James said, Aragon Court, or like or you know, you mentioned One Hive, like creating yeah, it at that level. Cosmos doesn't have that yet, or, or does it? Um, but I could see the governance module. The governance in Cosmos' uh, ecosystem is a little bit different because it's pretty much an up or down boat. And I don't know what uh, that looks like for, for like simple data verification. Um, cool. one, I mean, I mean, yeah. one thing that's relevant, I did, I did have a job at Facebook. Um, I don't think this is too confidential, but basically we'd have an algorithm that would show humans like, and we'd have to make decisions based off of that. So I think something where there's um, a dispute resolution algorithm to human incentive model somewhere down the road. And it could control inner DAO relations also. And so it, it would make DAOs interacting or cooperating easier. Yeah. Who? What other DAO wants to hold basin tokens? Yeah. Let's, let's Bunch talk up. about that. <laughs> um, James, you have your hand up. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I almost kind of see two different arbitration issues, right? Like one's going to be like, is this data correct? Like, you know, are the boundaries of this property correct? And, and to me, that that's a lot easier to have, you know, kind of data scrubbing, I guess, you know, DAOs. And then I can have a, like a second, maybe even more kind of softer, more complicated one where you'll need like soil experts, you know, almost like a, a DAO of experts or a arbitration panel of experts that can kind of like sift out the bullshit, I would think, from, from reality on, on whether or not like the practices these people are doing are scientifically correct, I guess. So, yeah. So like sift out, like, like one is the data correct. Like just that's like yes or no, basically. And then two, 
Like what, what's the nuance? Like what's the, the, the rigor of the data? Cool. Th thanks, James. Alex, you have your hand up. Oops, can't, can't hear you. Hey, Timo and everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Sorry, I missed the beginning of the call. But um, just to what you were saying, McKinney, and, and it seems like really this question of like verifying the data, how do we ensure that, you know, these, all these things are true. I mean, uh, I'm the co-founder of Regen CLT and we're in a sense trying to build that land stewardship layer that's filled with permaculture experts, you know, soil conservation experts, and, and real more like land-based, hands-in-the-dirt, environmental scientist type of people. And the, uh, at least for us, like a big um, component is this, is that there would be a community on the ground to support and implement these regenerative projects on an ongoing basis. And so I guess, you know, there's, of course, the technological heavy data um, confirmation through satellite imagery, through all these different more blockchain heavy tools. But I think there's also just the very real analog kind of like hands in the dirt, like let's dig a hole and do a soil analysis side of things that it maybe seems like it can't scale now, but I think a big part of really supporting this regenerative work art is having people on the ground to, to implement it ongoing. So those people could be an essential part of these, of the validation. of. of the well, I mean, it's a, you know, I, I go back to Alex, like you can do it yourself. You can, you know, get, get all the information yourself, try and implement it yourself. Or maybe you can, you know, second step, like hire like a network or join a network to share practice practices. Third, third thing is like people are talking about regeneration as a service, right? If like we do it for you, we, you know, we hire it. Some, someone can hire someone to do it, whether they be certified or whether they be a, a group to do it. Um, and the, the other one is like, we do it all ourselves. Like, you know, we have the people, we have the skills. And is, is there any other, any other ones you would add to those layers? Uh, I, I just think that the, like, as far as like regeneration as a service go and and maybe just uh, an air of skepticism for all this regenerative work is that it remains place-based. I think there's like a, a way higher level and bigger need for people to to the earth and 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 feel association with like a place-based community. And part of that can be that like stewardship, and then hopefully having eco credits plug in so people can be paid for the stewardship and there could be perpetual funding mechanisms for these regenerative projects. I would be just concerned that all of a sudden it's like creating this way for people to be part of this regenerative community, but not do any of the regenerating themselves or to create these markets where people are just like earning money by buying and selling eco credits instead of actually having the money go to the furthering of those ecological functions. So some how aligning this like natural capital stack and these mechanisms um, that I know Basin is doing such great work with identifying and, and, and defining um, and just really making sure that that stays grounded in the real work that needs. And so I know like for us, it's biased towards actually having place-based community on the ground for these things. You know, of course, there's an entire suite of technology that I know we're talking about and we're very interested integrating that will support those. Cool. And, and, and Alex, we, we've had them, um, you, know, you and I have had that conversation, Antonio, you know, we, we've had that conversation, like this, the bioregional, like, I mean, that, you know, ba the name basin, right, comes from watershed of, of like, how do you organize by watershed or by river? Um, and I, I mean, I love the the link between like the place base, like Alex, like what you're saying with like what James or McFinney, I think is his online name here. Um, it's set, set, like in terms of like arbitration, right? Like who are the experts who, you know, like an expert panel might need to have local people, you know, not a science, not someone who's a soil scientist in California, but a soil scientist in Indonesia or, you know, like who understands the ecosystem. So it almost, almost has to be created at, at the local level as well. Like where's the project at? Definitely. Yeah. The continuity and really creating that connection between this like higher level digitally empowered uh, you know, data and the technology that's kind of making all of this possible, but making sure that it's like, I like to think of it almost as like bottom up governance, bottom up decision making, you know, disputes that happen um, about certain things within a bioregion on a very specific piece of land probably shouldn't be resolved by like a global community that actually has no connection to that place. Yeah, but what can if somebody, it contradicts can, the rule of law? Can, can somebody kind of drop me like an example from the bottom up of like what all this data would look like on a property? Like, like does anyone have like a working example of? Well, I, I go out and paint my field green. So the satellite captures it and thinks it's yeah. vegetated <laughs> and smart. I get paid for it. And two years later, somebody finds out like, how does the network deal with it? Yeah. So I, I have uh, an idea an idea of how this could work if you have a, and i've 
just thinking in that first bucket of just what people can do without any additional equipment. So if you have a phone, you can take photos. If you could take photos uh, for a baseline, a property, and a predetermined methodology of, of what you're taking photos of and you know how you're taking them. And you know within a, an app, you could make sure that it's, it's not an, a pre-uploaded photo. You could also do something like with uh, how banks um, would uh, or, or financial tools will like have you like write down like a pre uh, randomized like uh, word and like show that in the image or something to like validate like this is right now and current um, and then uh, taking photos of the entire property and then submitting those photos to a, a platform where people then where you have like uh, maybe a hand three different times that each photo has to be like reviewed and you incentivize the reviewers to validate that what's in the photo is is accurate and kind of like i guess putting in what is listed or, or what dep is depicted in that photo and then you just have preset like schedule for like say once every month you have you, you start with a baseline and then you have photos that are submitted uh, month by month f over a course period of like a year or something and you have reviewers just validating the the what that uh, what is shown in those images to make sure that those reviewers are reviewed and like making sure that they're credible and i, I guess uh you could do that just make sure making sure that like it's anonymous that nobody knows like who's reviewing what and so there's no like coordination there um and then yeah you're just collecting data from individuals and in a verified way you know Possibly, it's not accurate data, right? It's not that second or third bucket where it's like more complex and in depth. But you could actually do something with that in a on like decentralized, like bottom up approach. James, th thanks, Seb. Um, James has his hand up. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask. I mean, maybe somebody can email me or, or something kind of like what an example data set would look like. I, I just I have a I, mean, I don't know if people know, but I have a project I've been working on. It's called Farm Mapper, which basically takes you know a parcel shape and then you can treat that almost like a relational database where you can save Google Docs and you can layer on other data layers over the top of it. You know, one of which would be like CropScape, right? So I can query what the USDA thought the activity was last year and it tries to identify what the you know what the crops were there. You know, if you're looking for a certain kind of cropping pattern, like there might be a way to verify it. I I'm just kind of spitballing here, but but if somebody can kind of send me what something like this would look like, that might kind of help me kind of get my mind around what, what you guys are looking for. I I think I mean that that's what we're kind of trying to establish, right? Like what does that data look like? The polygon, what what's on the land, what's below the land, like like was was Seb was saying about like photos, like okay, you know, or equipment needed, like okay, what what's in the soil, what's in the air? I mean, there's you know, there's there's uh guys doing like CO2 sensing, right? Monitoring in the air of like what CO2 like flows over the property, like localized. Um, I'm really interested in groundwater. And, and, and a problem that I have is we have these great state public databases that supposed to show like the strata and the depth and the groundwater table, the driller reports. But the problem is most, or I, I don't know, I know a lot of those reports are falsified intentionally. I don't know why, I, like truly I don't, um, but I, I know that they are. And so like you, we've got these situations where like the state or the public or the official data might not be accurate. Yeah, I think that happens like in Texas, they kind of had a race. For I'm in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a race. You can't drill a well like, like when you put them in the district. You can't drill a well within I don't know what it is like a half mile of each other. So like the the, the plan was to have everyone go out there and act like they were sinking their deep wells right in the corners of all the property, which kind of it's almost like a, a game at that standpoint. So some people with the money can stop the people without money from drilling wells. Cool. I, I, just one thing, Jeff. Before uh, back to James' question, Christian, if you have a data set right that you can share with with um, James or McFinney, uh, that'd be great. And then go, go ahead, Jeff. Um, another thing to consider is that like certain buyers of credits are going to be looking to fulfill certain needs, you know, at least organizational buyers. So they're going to want like certain things measured. Like that's going to determine something too. We don't have to measure everything all the time. We can be like, hey, you know, are you interested in this or that? Here's some properties that are suitable. We can start measuring it or they can even like help fund the measuring of it in a specific way. Then they get the, the revenue from the credits. Um, 
but it just seemed like, you know, like they were saying at Regen, people right now, they're just buying carbon and everything else is just like this added value, willingness to pay. Does it fulfill their goals or not? So how specifically everything is measured off the bat, I don't know if it's that important. Like that can come along in time. But right now, I mean, the goals they have aren't that numerical or quantitative. They just need to... Yeah, you're right. Like we know it'll do good. We just don't know like exactly how good, but that shouldn't stop us from proceeding. Exactly. And then we figure it out as we go. <laughs> so, so does everything work backwards, basically, from the carbon market, kind of drives the audit yeah. verification all the way through to hopefully the other softer goods that you know you can't measure at this point because there's no market for it? Is that kind of what? That's my experience. Um, but but I, I think that like my communities here will pay, like, like will pay co-fund ecological contracts to recharge locally to provide for water security um but the only reason like anybody listens to me is there's carbon money and uh, the only reason it would be feasible is there's carbon money yeah it's like james that's the the currency right now is is the metric ton equivalent of carbon whether you know whether that be methane or nitrous oxide converted to a, a carbon carbon ton equivalent and that's how we're pricing this stuff i mean the, the hope is is that biodiversity or eco some other ecosystem service or habitat or recreation, all this stuff in the full stack, could it be its own eco credit that someone else, someone would pay for because they want that item basically, or they want to either be philanthropy, either it be for offsetting reasons, just be, or, or a store of value. They want to buy those eco credits, put on their balance sheet or in their wallet, for example, because they know it's like good for their family or good for their community. Like um, the the region, the American West, we have these different parties um, that have water rights that may or may not be good. Region, like so, like the the Indian communities, the the reservations or whatever. Region gives them a tool to invest in their own water, food, medicinal security that hasn't. It, it's novel. And you know, James, something like along what Will said, we're we're talking about in basin, like these like bio regional like cur currencies. I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. You know, Alex, you guys are talking about it. Collectivo at um, like they're on cello, they're talking about it, but like these local stores of value where you get local stakeholders, like we're, we're having conversations with Jeff and I here in the Roaring Fork Valley with the local land trust, but also with a big regional bank that has 10 branches in our area about them putting natural capital or eco credits on their balance sheet because it supports their community. Right. I mean, they, if they, they're providing recreation, they're providing conservation, they're providing clean water by all, si all of a sudden being able to put a financial value on this stuff, it becomes a balance sheet item that banks can hold, you know, we can hold for our families. It's a, it's a way just to just put value on that. I mean, that's, that's the whole goal of what we're working towards is like, how do we take something that's valuable, but hasn't been priced yet, but price on it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I think about what cap and trade on sulfur markets, like when they basically reverse acid rain in the east, right? Like once they started those markets, and it's a lot easier because you have everything in point source area. Like it's easy to go to a factory and say, hey, you know, let's do a cap and trade. It's a lot harder with carbon because everything's a point source, you know? What could be interesting is like if as over time as the market develops a little more, they start using kind of DeFi protocols like Balancer that kind of naturally are meant to have like set kind of price, things that are tough to price, you can allow the market to do that. And so if there are problems with like supply and demand with like uh, the veers of the world not allowing supply going in, if you allow like the market to price that, then the price can keep going up and up. And so that's really gonna force the supply to come in. Right. Yeah, you, you can make synthetic assets too that, that can be like pinned to a price that that is, uh, I don't know, natural capital. I was also thinking of the pricing like wine. Like when you buy wine, what's the one thing they measure in all the wine bottles? Like it's just the alcohol content, right? It's the only thing. And you, don't, you buy wine because it's alcoholic, but you know, there's $5 wine and $100 wine and $1,000 wine. Um, mm -hmm. All the other stuff, like can't really measure. It's just value people are willing to pay for. You need a wine spectator. It's just like the story. It's just the story of this wine. I, I agree, uh, but that value is often local. Cause like I'm willing to pay for it because it, it's my wine. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of buyers are gonna want like place-based specific credits, right? That meet their goals or they're in their- Cool, well, well guys, we're, we're at time. I, I mean, I think, you know, it, two hours is a big chunk for people to take up and do. So we'll, we're, we're going to call it at this. Um, but this is awesome. I mean, to, to do two hours and still have, I think, 12 of us, 10 of us here or something like that, uh, nine of us uh, is, is really awesome. So thank you very much for all your like participation, your work. There's a couple of things we didn't get to, but we can, and some obvious stuff that came up. Um, but uh, so we can we can do another one sometime. And if, if everyone, you know, maybe take a screenshot of everyone on the call or just you know, reach out. If you didn't know someone on the call, reach out to me and I, I'm happy to introduce you. Um, but you guys are all welcome, of course, to Basin Dow and 
join us on what we're working on. And if we can help your projects like you know, data, your Christian pro or Christian, your data project or James, your you know, farm mapper or Lex Dow or you know, any of you guys' projects, like just let us know like how we can collaborate and keep moving this forward. So I'm sorry, I'll reach out. Cool. Well, th well thanks guys. Appreciate it. What are you up to next, Timo?